Welcome, and folks uh, online, um, welcome to the NASA Carbon Monitoring System Applications Policy Speaker Series. Uh, this is a series that um, I've followed with uh, a lot of enjoyment and attention that has been organized by uh, Vanessa Escobar uh, and Molly Brown and their, and their team. Um, today we're specifically looking at uh, the issue of blue carbon. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Emily Pigeon from uh, Conservation International to talk uh, a bit about some of the, um, this issue from uh, her perspective. From my perspective, this is interesting for uh, a couple of reasons. It cross-cuts NASA's uh, uh, carbon and ecosystem program in a couple of points. One of those is within the carbon monitoring system. Uh, we've got several of those investigations that have been funded in the 2014 uh, round that uh, we'll be looking at uh, blue carbon. It also cross cuts with uh, the North American Carbon Program with the coastal carbon synthesis effort that we've been doing for about five years now. Uh, we have uh, some folks from, from, um, from NOAA that have been participating in that uh, recently who are very interested in the, in the blue carbon. Uh, and just one, one uh, additional personal uh, comment, and, and um, this, is a, this is a pet peeve that Emily is not responsible for, so don't take this as a, as a comment uh, to you. But as a, uh, as a former oceanographer, I always find the, the notion of blue carbon, and this is a community that has decided to use that, potentially kind of confusing. Because in oceanography, when you talk about blue water oceanography, you're talking about the deep ocean. And so when I, hear, when I first heard blue carbon, I was expecting this to be, okay, this is like the, the, um, the carbon sink in the Southern Ocean or something like that, but it's not. Uh, it, it probably ought to be called muddy, icky carbon or something like that <laughs> because it's really talking about the carbon that's tied up in the estuaries and the wetlands and the coastal uh, areas, uh, uh, you know, rather than the the deep ocean. I suppose there's a deep ocean component to it, but a lot of it is in, in uh, what oceanographers would call brown water, not, not, not uh, blue water. Um, so that might help uh, clear up uh, if there's anyone with an ocean cross cut, cut uh, potential uh, confusion about what uh, the term um, even means. Uh, but in any case, uh, Emily, thank you very much for coming here this afternoon. and. I and everybody else look forward to hearing what you're uh, going to tell us. Oh, I'm supposed to say that uh, questions uh, from the floor should be via microphone and questions online should be on the chat box, and uh, the support team here will read those off. Sponsored by the Joint Global Carbon Cycle Center, co-sponsored. Refreshments right out the door. Well, thank you for that. It, uh, it's interesting because um, I came to I uh, moved to Conservation International from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. So I have uh, a uh, sympathy with the uh, confusion, or one might say, academic um, annoyance at the phrase blue carbon. But I think it's a really nice place to start because it's an example of how we have uh, uh, started talking about this in a way that we can start talking about it in a policy context. Because uh, as you'll see today, um, if we're talking about carbon in the oceans, um, in some ways it would be much more interesting to be talking about carbon in the deep ocean, in the true blue carbon, you might say. But the uh, policy arena isn't quite ready for that. So we've, we, we've sort of got to step up and meet them where they're at um, and uh, really introduce the science in a way that uh, is, is useful uh, in it from a policy point of view. So that was a nice introduction from, from that point of view. And if I haven't answered the question as to why it's, it's the brown carbon we're calling blue carbon by the end, you can call me on it and we'll see if we can uh, explain it better then. So um, thank you very much for having me. It's exciting to come talk to uh, the CMS policy seminar. Um, the carbon monitoring um, system has been, I think, uh, had a very important role in developing um, science that's appropriate for policy and conservation. And I think in, 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 tra in fostering the transfer between that science um, and the policy, conservation and management that 
that it is designed to address. And so today I, I come with two real purposes. One is to describe for you an example, if you like, of um, carbon science being used to really promote conservation, to promote policy and promote management of these coastal ecosystems. Um, and, and how we ha that has progressed and how um, we've had some real successes in doing that over the last five years. But I think more importantly, I think this shows as an example of how the science community has been fundamental to this occurring and how we need the science community to be part of this process. And, and, and gives a few little examples of how the science community has been part of this process. So um, if I do nothing else, I want to encourage the carbon science community to step up and produce the fabulous science, but also be part of the process of transferring that into action on the ground. So about five years ago now, um, a number of the environmental NGOs, including Conservation International, IUCN, and then the Intergovernmental Oceanographic uh, Commission, which is part of UNESCO, uh, started working on bringing coastal ecosystems, which by which we mean the very carbon-rich ecosystems of mangrove seagrasses and salt marshes into climate change discussions. Now, at that point five years ago, if you went to any of the policy discussions or went to meet with policymakers um, about climate change mitigation, talking about global car carbon cycles, they understood the significance of terrestrial forests to the global carbon cycle, but really had no comprehension beyond very basic um, ideas of the role of marine ecosystems and actually probably a large number of the terrestrial ecosystems as, as to how they were important uh, in, the, in the carbon cycle. So once the carbon went into the ocean, how was it sequestered? Where was it sequestered? How did this fit into the whole um, discussion? So um, as a scientist, you can really see that the policy discussion was missing out on sort of some pretty fundamental pieces of the carbon cycle. Um, and so these systems, which are the ones that I'm concerned with from a conservation point of view, the mangrove seagrasses and salt marshes, were completely ignored, despite the fact that they have these very large, very rich carbon uh, deposits and have very uh, large amounts of carbon se um, sequestration rates, or very large carbon sequestration rates. So the um, climate change mitigation community, just, these were just completely absent uh, from any sort of discussion. Um, and this is despite the fact that there is decades of work in the conservation community working on um, restoring, conserving these systems. They have many, many ecosystem services, as we call them, that are very important to communities around the world. Uh, many of the most poverty-stricken communities depend on mangrove, salt marsh, seagrass for fisheries. Uh, coastal protection has become an issue um, of uh, increasing um, visibility, uh, water quality, uh, livelihoods, many of the places I work regularly, tourism in um, coastal tourism, which is completely dependent on these systems, is um, uh, um, probably the major form of livelihood. They have cultural value. Um, but then um, we've only just, the one thing that's new to the conservation community is recognising the uh, carbon sequestration and storage value. So while these systems were new to the carbon community, the carbon value of these systems was something that was new to the conservation community. And so we, um, uh, it's been very interesting to work with the conservation community and, and point out to them that these systems have, uh, on average, carbon sequestration rates which are uh, at least 10 often orders of magnitude higher than the terrestrial forests, which is where the conservation community has f traditionally focused its um, uh, th thinking about the role of ecosystems in, in, in the carbon cycle. Um, and those incredibly efficient um, uh, sequestration rates that um, are continuous have resulted in uh, very large carbon stores and, and um, uh, and I think the thing that has also been interesting working with the conservation community is because the, traditionally they have been thinking about often tropical forests, this idea of really thinking about the organic carbon in the soils um, has been a, a real revelation for them to think about. So there's this transition that's been required 
from the, by the conservation and management community to also see new values in the systems that they've been thinking about for a long time. Um, and and uh, these systems, why have we been thinking about them? Not only are they incredibly valuable for communities around the world, they're um, uh, arguably the most threatened ecosystems on Earth. Uh, on average, we're losing about 1.5% to 2% of them per year. Um, there was one estimate that at the current rates of deforestation in mangroves, um, within the next 50 years, all unprotected mangroves will be lost. And I mean, I think that's probably slightly hyperbole, but it really does illustrate the rates of loss that we're seeing in these systems. And with these rates of loss, um, we can see that the emissions, at least on local levels, resulting from um, uh, uh, loss of these systems, these very carbon-rich systems, are actually significant. So um, uh, using some fairly crude data, um, uh, we can uh, see that the emissions that result from annual loss of those three ecosystems is on average about 0.5 pentagrams of CO2 per year. Now this is about 10% of one of the estimates of tropical deforestation emissions. But this is um, despite the fact that these um, ecosystems constitute less than 1% of the area of these systems. So 10% of the emissions, um, but 1% of the area. and so. Um, one of the questions that this really brings to mind from a, a, a conservationist's point of view is, um, can we use this? Can we leverage the carbon value of these systems and the emissions that are resulting from their loss um, to cause better management, better conservation and restoration of these coastal ecosystems? As a com conservation community, we've been working on trying to conserve and restore these systems now for decades but we're still seeing these very rapid rates of loss. So we're sort of wondering if this is something else that we can put in our toolbox and contribute to um, uh, turning that, uh, that loss around. Can we increase the recognition of the mitigation value of these systems? Can we uh, imp use it to uh, motivate improved management and regulation of these systems? And um, can we use it as a way of trying to um, provide incentives to conserve or restore these systems? Um, so uh, with this in mind, uh, the three uh, non-conservation um, groups, Conservation International, IUCN, uh, and the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission um, formed the Blue Carbon Initiative about four years ago. And um, this... Uh, initiative was really set up to be um, a, uh, a catalyst to support um, this idea of how do we use the carbon value of these systems to motivate conservation and restoration of these, these um, uh, coastal ecosystems. And um, it's had, I think we've really had some success in moving this forward. We've still got a long way to go and I'm, I'm going to describe that here. Uh, it's important to emphasise though that the success we've had in the policy arena has been a real community effort. This initiative has set up a few um, uh, um, programs, projects um, and tasks that um, have supported um, the community as it moves forward, but we've had a large number of scientists, conservation, um, uh, conservation groups, um, policy makers all work together to really move us forward in a way that um, has been really um, rewarding to be part of. And so um, I by no means claim the, all of the successes that I'm going to describe. I, I, it really has been a very rewarding um, community effort. So uh, if we're, um, uh, as, we, as we start to think about um, how do we start um, addressing um, carbon into uh, or making sure that policy and management starts to include the um, carbon science that we know of for these coastal ecosystems. There's basically three levels that we've been working on. Um, the international climate change, um, uh, at an international level, um, we've seen there's a number of key components, whether it be um, report national countries or uh, organisations uh, reporting their annual greenhouse gas emissions, um, working through the, the UNFCCC um, and really looking at the international funding available for all of those things, 
Um, national is a couple of countries, which I'll describe uh, in a minute, that have really taken a leadership role, the US being one, um, both through the climate change policy, but also through national marine policy. Um, and then um, we're seeing um, a very rapidly multiplying number of site or project level um, actions ongoing globally where we're starting to see um, carbon value of these systems both providing funding for conservation and management um, but also motivating the actual management in itself um, on the ground. And so I I'll just go through some of these because I think they're nice examples where we can actually see um, that. But um, when we started this process um, four, four or five years ago of trying to work out how we integrate uh, coastal carbon, coastal blue carbon into these various um, mechanisms and various uh, levels, both from the site all the way up to the international level. Um, the first thing we really had to do was understand um, how do we get people's attention? I mean, you can't really go and work um, on um, addressing the policy uh, on any of those level if um, we really weren't even on the map from a um, carbon point of view, as I discussed before. So um, the first thing that uh, we did as a group, um, as, or as the three NGOs as part of the Blue Carbon Initiative, was to form the International Blue Carbon Scientific Working Group. I think there's a few NASA people in the crowd there. Um, and um, initially the charge to this group um, was to really assess the science and say before we go um, and start talking to policymakers at the UNFCCC level, at national government level or even at local level, is the science really compelling enough um, to argue that coastal ecosystems should be included in climate change policy? At that time, the science was very much scattered in, in papers across the literature and there wasn't really a cohesive way of addressing the, the fundamental questions that the policymakers um, uh, would ask us. And so that motivated by uh, that group um, and an extended um, number of, uh, an extended group of um, scientists, uh, we produced um, a number of key papers here. And these papers are very synthetic. They start putting the science that was out there in um, and addressing key questions that the policymakers ask us when we turn up. And those are the basics, you know, why should we pay attention to you? How much carbon is in your systems? Where is it? Is it anywhere that's significant? Um, and what are the potential emissions? And so with this uh, selection of synthetic um, papers, we really were able to, to pull together the science as it was, identify the gaps as we had them in answering these questions, but then also present the information in a um, scientifically literate but compelling way to um, policy makers. And so this is, this is how you get attention. And then once you have that attention, um, have the capacity to ask, answer that, those questions, um, you need to go out and communicate and outreach to the, the policy community. And so um, we have an ongoing effort by members of the science working group, by um, uh, an, an extended network of coastal carbon uh, related scientists to really talk to everybody and anyone associated with managing or implementing policy associated with these coastal ecosystems. And so um, there's uh, Dan LaFolle from IUCN, Jim Falkran from Florida International University, myself, Boone Kaufman from Oregon State University, um, talking at the European Parliament. And we've done um, presentations for at numerous countries. We're in Brazil next week talking to policymakers. We've been... Um, I can't even remember how many different countries. We're very much in contact with uh, US policymakers, the US Working Group on Blue Carbon. And this uh, outreach and communication effort has been a real community effort um, to uh, build awareness. But this isn't where it ends. So you can go out and you can make everybody excited and say, yes, your carbon is very important. We should be paying attention to it. But then they stare at you and say, um, so uh, what do you want, to do, want us to do? So you then need to know and understand what, what policy change, where, what's, what's needed. And if we're talking about climate change policy, um, the... 
the uh, sort of the broad international framework for climate change policy in every country, pretty much, um, there's probably an exception or two that, is um, provided by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC. Now, this is a very vague um, international agreement between all the signatories of the UN um, to uh, basically stabilise greenhouse gas concentrations. And underneath this big framework are um, numerous other treaties and protocols you may have heard of. Um, Kyoto Protocol, um, the Durban Platform, these sorts of things that actually um, provide mechanisms for trying to achieve that. And um, in my personal experience, but also generally accepted, the UNFCCC is far from a perfect um, uh, mechanism to, to get climate change, to address the impacts of climate change. It is slow. It's highly inefficient. It is the most bureaucratic system that I can possibly imagine. Um, it is, however, the global framework. So it's utterly essential that we're here. So it's really important to ask, uh, well, we ask ourselves, how do we integrate coastal ecosystems within this massive monolith of um, uh, uh, a framework and all the various structures that go underneath this. And so, I mean, there's whole um, seminars that can be given just on how you do this. So um, we brought together a, a second working group that was really focused on um, policy and how, how, do we do, how do we do this? Where, where are the opportunities within the UNFCCC to start integrating policy? What science is needed that speaks to those opportunities? Um, and uh, um, what, what, what are the, uh, the strategies and the techniques? And this group produced a document called the Blue Carbon Policy Framework, and this is a very dry policy document, but it really outlines some of the key tasks um, that needed to be addressed um, to, to, to ensure that coastal ecosystems were included in that um, broader... In, in this uh, large international framework. And some of the, the key things that they came up with was that um, coastal ecosystems must be at least eligible for inclusion in national greenhouse gas accounting. So in countries where loss of ecosystems were significant, co coastal ecosystems were causing significant greenhouse gas emissions, there needed to be a mechanism that, it, uh, that they at least could or at least or should be including those emissions uh, in their national greenhouse accounting. And at the time, um, the uh, IPCC guidelines for national greenhouse gas inventories, the 2006 version, didn't actually mention the word oceans, didn't appear in any of those guidelines. So, led by uh, Hilary Kennedy, Dan Alonghi, and then a few other members of the working group, um, became very active in the IPCC group that were reviewing those guidelines. And as of last October, we have this revision to the guidelines, which we now have whole chapters associated with coastal waters or, or coastal wetlands. So this means that there is now a uh, UNFCCC IPCC uh, set of guidelines it's again, IP, all the issues associated with IPCC are inherent here, but um, countries now have recommended guidelines for how to include emissions from these systems um, in um, their national accounting. And this is the science community drove this and was very fundamental in, in making this happen. This was one of the recommendations. Um, as I mentioned, the UNFCCC has a whole um, spider's web of various um, what they call mechanisms underneath it, which are really just um, approaches for trying to uh, achieve the goal of curbing climate change. Um, and there are numerous, but two that are particularly relevant with coastal ecosystems are the Nationally Appropriate Mitigation Actions, or NAMAs, which are actions that countries would undertake to um, mitigate climate change. Um, and the reduced emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, or RED. And again, this is a mechanism for recognising the climate mitigation of um, was originally restricted to, to forest management. Now, we've... Uh, um, uh, the analysis of our policy working group is that coastal ecosystems should be eligible in the language as it is in both of these systems, in, the, in the, the bureaucratic policy language that's set up for these systems. But the key thing that we need to do to ensure that we can uh, 
have coastal ecosystems in these various components of what the UNFCCC puts together is that we had to build awareness amongst um, all of the communities implementing this policy that coastal ecosystems were eligible. Um, and then we had to provide the technical tools to make that eligibility usable. So within, for instance, the uh, red reduced emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, there are requirements to monitor your forests, which I know many people um, involved in CMS have been very involved um, in various techniques for forest monitoring, whether it be carbon levels. If we don't have those same tools for these coastal ecosystems, despite the fact that they are legally allowed in these um, uh, mechanisms, uh, it, we don't, there's no way of actually enforcing or trying to encourage countries to include these systems in these discussions. Um, and so, in some ways, you can ask the cynical question of why do we actually care about this? And as always, it all comes down to money. Um, these are the funds that have been provided for just some of these components of the UNFCCC. And we're talking hundreds of millions to billions of dollars are going to be either have or will be available for projects under these mechanisms. Um, so clearly, if we want to use the carbon value of these systems to motivate conservation and better management of these systems, we, we need to show that we can and have the tools to be eligible under these various UNFCCC mechanisms to access these very large amounts of funding. Um, so over the last four years, we've actually made some real progress on this front. Um, and being the UNFCCC, it moves very slowly and in slightly mysterious ways. Um, there's been a workshop. There was an official sanctioned UNFCCC workshop last year on ecosystems with high carbon reservoirs not covered by other agenda items under the convention. That's very classic UNFCCC speak. But what it meant was um, everybody that we haven't been paying attention to. And one of the things that came out of that um, workshop was they finally recognised that the scientific knowledge is, to, is sufficient for coastal ecosystems to be included in UNFCCC efforts. This was big. doesn't seem like much, but for them to recognise that, yes, the science is there, that these systems can be uh, included is a huge step. Um, and that sh uh, there should be support for developing countries to include coastal systems in their greenhouse gas inventories. So countries, many of the countries where emissions from coastal ecosystem loss are actually the highest um, are countries that have very limited capacity to actually do the technical calculations associated with that. And so we need support. Um, in the uh, large UNFCCC, uh, what they call Conference of Parties, COP, last December, they endorsed those IPCC guidelines that had been uh, worked on so hard by the uh, uh, coastal carbon science community. Um, and in the most recent meeting, they, uh, there was general recognition, and again, these are very UNFCCC speak words that don't seem to um, seem very committal, but are actually quite significant in that context, that mangroves should be included within red, um, and increasing recognition of the coastal ecosystems generally. So in the fairly amorphous um, UNFCCC speak, this, is, this has seen real um, progress in going from not even really understanding that these systems had carbon in them to uh, really recognising that these systems should be integrated in this mechanism. Um, those are, uh, that, um, we're already starting to see the um, uh, knock-on effects of this hard work of including these systems. So uh, the US EPA um, is already committed to it, um, uh, in, uh, including or at least uh, um, attempting to include coastal wetlands in the US national greenhouse gas inventories in starting this year, which is um, the uh, emissions from wetlands in the US are actually going to be barely a line on that plot, which is the uh, annual US emissions from land use change. But the very act of doing this and really giving it a test run, I think, is shows some real leadership by the EPA. Uh, and I'm very grateful for them doing this because it provides um, the rest of us with a mechanism to go and argue globally that other countries where this is more significant should, should be doing the same thing. Um, the US has also, I mean, has really been leading on this thanks to work uh, by NOAA and other um, groups or the other um, groups within the US government. Uh, this is a paper that was produced out of NOAA 
last year where they had done um, a full analysis of US federal statutes and policies and really um, come to the conclusion that um, uh, there wasn't any new laws required to start addressing carbon through existing coastal policy, coastal policy and regulation in the US. And uh, just a few examples pulling out of that paper. The uh, National Environmental Policy Act um, already includes um, a mandate to include ecosystem services in um, planning federal actions and while carbon hasn't been one of those ecosystem services that has been included to date, there's no reason why it shouldn't be. Um, the Clean Water Act uh, requires compensatory mitigation for un unavoidable impacts. Um, so, for instance, if in a development you um, have a significant impact on a wetland, you are required to compensate for that. Um, again, the carbon has not been included in the enforcement of that regulation, but there's no reason why it shouldn't be. Um, similarly, the Coastal Zone Management Act has um, examples. And so here we can see NOAA really starting to um, look at um, management policy um, and regulations that start um, using the carbon values of these systems to increase uh, conservation and restoration of these systems. Uh, this just came out last week, uh, and this was a, a, a document that came out of the White House um, and was put together again by um, a number of uh, agencies whereby um, looking at uh, increasing climate resilience of uh, the natural resources in the US and it was very significant, I've got it highlighted here, you can't really see it very well, but this is in the executive summary. So in the very front of this document we see that managing and enhancing US carbon sinks includes conserving and restoring soils, forests, grasslands, wetlands and coastal areas that store carbon. So we've seen we, that we've actually seen this science has made it into very high level policy coming out of the White House last week. So on this sort of national level policy we've really seen the US um, uh, agencies take a, um, a very useful leadership role that we can use uh, in other countries. Another country that has um, really been looking at this strongly is Indonesia. Um, and unlike the US, um, Indonesia may be the richest coastal carbon country and in fact probably from an emissions point of view the most important carbon, um, coastal carbon, blue carbon country in the world. Um, it has um, uh, the largest mangrove cover of any country in the world by a very significant margin and it has rates of loss um, the most recent numbers are about one and a half percent per year but um, in some parts of Indonesia it would be multiples of that very easily um, we also know from um, work we don't have uh, specific data for uh, Indonesia in particular, but work um, from looking, for instance, this is a mangrove carbon um, uh, work from Dan Donato and Boone Kaufman, um, that the mangroves in the Indo-Pacific, which includes um, data from Indonesia, are, are very, very rich carbon. Um, and so these rates of loss have significant emissions associated with them. And Indonesia has been very conscious of their place uh, at the front uh, of the blue carbon discussion um, and I think admirably are um, stepping up and really um, given their capacity um, really making strides in trying to address this. So for instance they uh, earlier this year have instigated a national science plan of action for blue carbon so have a whole um, science uh, research strategy for looking at uh, carbon within Indonesia because uh, while um, it seems that this must be one of the uh, largest deposits and largest sources of emissions from carbon in these systems, we don't have the data to fully um, put that together yet. The Indonesian National Council on Climate Change, which is their uh, most um, senior body um, addressing climate change is uh, just about to implement a greenhouse gas emissions scheme um, and it has very explicitly already said that they will be including coastal carbon. Um, the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries which is the ministry within the Indonesian government that, that uh, manages coastal areas um, has officially given uh, blue carbon as one of its, uh, its activities which means that it is uh, able to work 
um, looking at carbon in these systems uh, in a, in a, and, and fund those activities. One thing that is not, hasn't been done in Indonesia yet is that these systems are not being included in the national greenhouse gas inventories. And at this stage, um, they are not intending on um, using those new uh, greenhouse gas guidelines. And that's despite the fact that a sort of fairly back of the envelope estimate is that emissions from uh, loss of coastal ecosystems in Indonesia probably are about 5% of the Indonesian emissions. And remembering that Indonesia is easily in the top five um, countries in the world for global um, carbon emissions. And so they need the science right now to um, not only do the accounting um, to... Uh, to uh, include this, these systems in the national inventories, but um, to, to monitor that into the future. And, and that, that's really what's missing here to convince them to do this. There are a number of other countries looking at this, and they are from all over the world. It's really quite startling. Abu Dhabi has done an assessment of its coastal carbon. Um, and uh, we've just seen a report out of Scotland looking at, at its... Um, uh, carbon budgets in its um, mostly uh, seagrasses and salt marshes. Australia has um, uh, made it a research priority and put together a CSIRO-led car um, coastal carbon cluster with, I think, a budget of four or five million dollars um, for research in this topic. Other countries that are, are um, uh, working on this at a national level include Costa Rica, Ecuador, the Philippines, um, a few countries in Africa. And so this is, this is we're seeing some real momentum that uh, national governments are, are paying attention to this. Each one of these countries, though, needs the science support to be able to do the calculations. So um, as we uh, look at these national projects, um, really... Um, Sort of feeding up into those to those national calculations has to be thinking about what it looks like on the ground, and really this is the piece that I personally am most interested in. There is a rapidly expanding number of field projects, um, either implementing um, management or trying to support the project through looking at the carbon value of these systems. Uh, here's just an example of one that I'm personally involved in in the Gulf of Nicoya in Costa Rica, which uh, is on the north coast of Costa Rica on the Pacific side. Um, the Gulf of Nicoya is probably the most productive estuary in, in Costa Rica, um, and we work with a number of communities there that are very poor and are very dependent on the mangroves for um, subsistence fisheries, for um, coastal protection, erosion control. And we are um, currently trying to work on developing and supporting policy and management that conserves, restores and, and promotes sustainable use of the mangroves. That's the objective of this conservation project here. Um, but we also know, um, this is some work done by Miguel Fuentes, who's at Cartier, um, that these mangroves um, have, uh, we've lost... Um, about 16% of the mangroves in this very uh, important estuary um, in the last 50 or so years, and that um, equates to about 2.2 million tonnes of CO2 emissions. So um, the project that we want to do is we want to restore these mangrove areas, um, we want to implement and support sustainable management through local communities, and we want to educate the communities on how to use their mangroves sustainably. And um, But can we use this carbon value of these systems to um, provide the funding necessary, not just the immediate funding, but the long-term sustainable funding um, to uh, implement that project. <clears throat> and so this is some work done um, by Brian Murray and colleagues, his colleagues at the Nicholas Institute in, at Duke University. And the Nicholas Institute at Duke has been um, really... Uh, I think fundamentally important in helping us think about the economics of doing this, really looking at these various market mechanisms that are out there, looking at carbon markets um, and whether it's viable um, to uh, be using carbon markets, whether they be regulatory or um, voluntary markets, uh, to, to fund these projects. So um, the main piece, the message from this slide is really saying that um, if we look at the um, possible carbon value per hectare of these ecosystems, 
Um, it's very um, comparable to what we see in tr tropical forests. And I mean, this, of course, varies greatly with um, the carbon density, the location, and all sorts of variables. But that these systems have uh, carbon values associated with them that are very comparable to tropical forest, and there are numerous carbon projects out there now um, funding conservation and restoration of upland tropical forest using carbon markets. So the message here is that while we haven't done it yet, this is a very viable approach to funding conservation or management projects in these regions. Um, carbon markets is another whole seminar unto itself, um, and if you're interested in that, I can recommend somebody. Um, but to uh, put a, um, a project, a conservation project, um, on a carbon market, to actually um, put it together in a way that you can sell the carbon credits is not a simple thing to do. Um, and there's a lot of science necessary, a lot of techniques, a lot of support to make this happen. Um, first of all, you, you have to develop the project, which isn't just doing all the things I normally do in putting a conservation project together, but it's also including working out what the carbon value of the system is, what the potential carbon emissions might be, and what the carbon um, benefits of your actions might be. And that's, I think, where um, uh, we, we really need support. Um, there's a validation process, and that validation process um, is comparing your project to a standardised set of rules as to what constitutes a good carbon project. Um, you then need to monitor the carbon in that project and all the other promised benefits from that project um, and uh, get verification that, yes, you promised us so many carbon credits there would be an, either a maintained or, or avoided carbon emissions of so much uh, and that you have actually come through on those. Um, and then at that point, they issue carbon credits that you can go onto a market and sell. So for us to be able to produce these sorts of projects in our, in our system, in our ecosystems, in, we fundamentally need standardised methodologies for carbon accounting in wetlands. So there has to be a way for a market to go and say, yes, this fits all the criteria. We know that this is a good quality carbon project. They will produce the, the carbon offsets that they say that they will. So there's um, a small, smaller NGO or non-conservation organisation based here in the US called Restore America's Estuaries, and they have really been leading the process of coming up with these standardised methodologies. And again, they really lent hard on the carbon... Um, science community to put the most robust but usable methodologies together um, and then the verified carbon standard which is a, um, uh, a, a, a an organization charged with um, certifying these methodologies as being um, valid has been working with them to um, put together a, a methodology for restoration projects and for conservation projects so Again, this is very nitty-gritty, but it's where we've really lent on the science community to produce tools, methodologies that are scientifically rigorous but allow us access to these, these market-based sources of funding. And so the ultimate goal is to have your project listed here, which is, this is I just took this off yesterday's VCS website, whereby uh, your projects are listed with the estimated annual emissions reductions and anybody can go to these websites and basically buy carbon offset credits. And so that is a way of, of funding your projects. And each one of these projects has gone through these various rigorous methodologies and verifications to guarantee that whoever is buying those credits knows that the, the offsets associated with it are guaranteed. So... Um, this, to my knowledge, has not been done in coastal ecosystems yet. Um, but uh, hopefully will be soon. We're moving in that direction. So um, where are we? Okay. Um, we, we, I think we've, we've made real significant progress from the start, whereby uh, five years ago there really wasn't recognition outside the science community that coastal ecosystems uh, were important um, in uh, the, nat the global carbon cycle to now really having made significant progress on the international, national, and, and now on a project level. Um, however, um, we still have real needs to move this forward. Um, and so I put this together. So this is, this is my request list from the carbon, community, carbon science community. And I, it's probably extensive. But 
Um, when it comes to uh, the key things that uh, we need the science to do at the moment, we need to still demonstrate the value of co coastal ecosystems and we need to demonstrate it more uh, specifically from a geographical point of view and more specifically um, from a temporal point of view. Um, and we need the tools to implement all of those pieces of policy that I just described. So what does that mean? We really need global and local scale mapping of mangrove salt marshes and seagrasses, whether that be extent, the carbon, and then the, then the capacity to monitor all of those things. Now, I think the mangrove community is making progress on this. Um, salt marsh, we've had some discussion of this, but really, um, when, especially when it becomes, to, it comes to a below ground carbon, um, and monitoring of these systems. We've got really a long way to go. Um, the key thing that a lot of, if you're putting a, a project together on the ground or that national account, um, carbon accounting is very interested in is what the emissions are from healthy integrated systems. So if I convert your mangrove to a shrimp pond in Southeast Asia, what's, how do I, I need a number to know what the, the emissions are out of that so I can include it in the accounting system. So we really need measurements of these emissions. This is one of the things that uh, the science working group was really um, instrumental in changing um, uh, where we're doing measurements of carbon emissions. Prior to about two or three years ago, all of the measurements of emissions out there were all in pristine systems because if I'm a mangrove scientist, I want to go measure in nice systems, not horrible, degraded, nasty shrimp ponds. But those measurements out of the horrible, degraded, nasty shrimp ponds are really fundamental to moving the policy forward because they're where we can demonstrate that those systems are causing emissions. Uh, clearly, we can't do those emissions everywhere, so looking at carbon change ecosystem shift models and ways that we can come up with these solutions without going out and getting too muddy is very useful. There are a couple of people, Jim Morris, and um, working on these, but this really needs expansion. Um, and we really need estimates of storage and emissions from priority regions. Indonesia is the one that comes to my mind, but any of these high carbon rich countries to be really able to support them in implementing this on a national policy level, we need to help them get the numbers and monitor this. Um, we need a globally accessible, quality controlled coastal da uh, data archive. There's a very nice uh, data archive for all the blue water carbon um, measurements that are out there. Um, but uh, to support countries in actually doing the policy, to support the implementation of projects, we need somewhere to go that we can uh, use numbers um, uh, that uh, we feel comfortable using. And I think this has got very numerous uh, scientific but also um, uh, policy related applications. That's a very high priority. Um, and then the one of the, the ecosystem here that really has not got the level of attention that it deserves and is very important are the seagrasses. Um, talking about to the carbon monitoring um, crowd. Uh, how do we go and use um, remote sensing techniques to monitor seagrasses um, in a uh, um, reliable, repeatable, not too intensive uh, way, in the same way that we're starting to move on the, on the mangrove front? This is key to really integrating these systems into this discussion. Um, and then again, standards and methodologies for doing all those pieces um, that where the policy is now beginning to require countries and ground level projects to do. Um, but I think most of all, I think I would encourage you all to become involved in some way, uh, whether it be in coastal carbon or, or, or the discussion about the carbon cycle more generally, because this has only been possible because there's a group of scientists that have really committed uh, significant amounts of their time and intellectual effort to, to sort of really addressing the policy questions and then going out and talking about them. So uh, with that, thank you. I'm happy to answer questions either now or via email at some later date. Emily, thank you. I apologize for not introducing you earlier. Peter was kind enough to do that. Um, there's a lot in your presentation that we would love to discuss at the November meeting, which you already know about, about getting people involved in policy. So we'll, we'll bring that, and we're going to post your, your talk and your slides to the CMS website. Um, but if there's any question, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from our pre-presentation, uh, 
uh, talk conversation, yes, that next to that last slide would be very useful for the North American Carbon Program, you know, coastal carbon plan that we're putting together. I have so many questions, and we'll meet some other time, so I'll restrict myself uh, to one. Uh, and you kind of touched on it, on that economics. So one of the biggest drivers to mangrove deforestation, removal, destruction in Indonesia and Southeast Asia is the global market for farmed shrimp and crab I don't and other them. seafoods. Uh, what's that? I don't eat shrimp anymore. Yeah, I do. Well, I, you know, I, and, and as a matter of fact, uh, I, I do, n I always look to see where it c comes from. And if the shrimp comes from, or crab comes from Southeast Asia, Indonesia, I do not buy it. And I tell all my friends not to. Um, but uh, so what I'm wondering is that when you're looking at the carbon economics, um, the uh, and there's a similar problem with 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 uh, economics for like soy production in in uh, in the Amazon. They make metric tons of money off of uh, the shrimp and the crab. How does the the economic driver f for the re destruction of the um, mangroves for the production of these farmed uh, seafood compared to what you might be able to get for that area in a carbon market? So, so to, to the, the quick answer to your question is you should ask Brian Murray from Duke University up to come and talk about this because he's the real expert. But, and, I, and Brian, I don't know if he's listening, but if, forgive me, but they have done the analysis and the, um, uh, the economics of shrimp production in Southeast Asia is such that the carbon value is probably enough uh, to because the actual um, uh, income they get from shrimp is the reason it's so cheap, cheap in the Safeway down here is is that they actually get a very small income. No, so you don't actually, and that those carbon systems are so rich that the uh, the carbon market value associated with doing that is. Um, is not actually that insurmountable. It's when you get come up against uh, luxury hotels, these sorts of things, that the opportunity cost can, act, you know, swamps any carbon value that you have. From looking at these um, conservation projects, I don't expect to ever get a conservation project where the carbon value is enough to really motivate the project in itself. However, it, one of the hard parts of funding conservation, well, it's all hard, but... Um, Getting the initial funding, the sort of the ease, the, the, the let's set up the project, let's come up with sustainable livelihoods, uh, alternative livelihoods for the communities that have been dependent on the shrimp farms, etc. Though there's a lot of funding, or not a lot, there, there is funding available for that. The problem is that the, to keep the project going into the long term is often a small but continuous amount of money that needs to, to, to maintain it. And often that's the hardest part of of funding. It's not that interesting. It's just keeping things going. And I think that's where the real potential for carbon funding is, is in that sort of small but continuous tail of funding that's required to keep these projects going. Um, and, um, and so I think we're, we're starting to see that sort of approach um, take on. The other, I mean, the other key thing is, especially where I'm working in the Philippines at the moment, the real focus there is on coastal protection for mangroves. There's some recent work showing that if you had healthy mangroves during Haiyan, um, you weren't exactly well off, but you were definitely better off than if you'd cleared out your mangroves for shrimp ponds. Um, so uh, the carbon uh, potential of those systems is really just contributing to other funding that's available. Other yes. Services exactly. Possible. One quick question before Lola. Um, simply, our online cuts off at noon, and I want to make sure I address this. Um, do you know, Emily, if there's any effort like this for coastal freshwater wetlands? Um, uh, peatlands, there is definitely. So Wetlands International, a number of NGOs are really looking at peatlands. Peatlands have um, the issue that they are natural methane emitters. Mm -hmm. So the whole carbon uh, greenhouse gas emitting, um, a greenhouse gas accounting in those systems is much trickier. Um, but some work by Pat McGonigal at um, the Smithsonian has shown that once you get a salinity, I think it's um, 18 parts per thousand, you'd have to look up that, um, that, that methane issue um, is no longer valid. But yes, there is definitely um, uh, a whole uh, group of people working on freshwater, often peatlands in places like Southeast Asia. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Go ahead, Lola, please. Hi. 
My question, oh, there you go. Okay. My question is, do you have a list of the countries, I guess in order of preference, that have a, the highest deforestation rates in coastal ecosystems? Is no, and I need you as one of the people who does this to, to put that country, that list together. I think that would be, um, and I know Chandragiri and various people have been doing this monitoring, but I think uh, from what I can see, it's not in the literature to give me that list of rates of deforestation. And so, I mean, that's, that's, that's one of my requests for my list, please. in the common area right after this talk. If any of you would like to join us, um, please feel free to stay behind. Uh, next week, well, next month, we do have a talk on um, MRV and LIDAR applications in California, Sonoma County specifically. We are rescheduling our speakers. That's why you have a TBD up there. But we will send out um, an announcement to everybody, and hopefully you can join. And uh, again, thank you very much, Emily, for your talk. And um, we look forward you. to learning more. Thank you.